Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming this morning, and we look forward to working with you this week. I am Mark Smolinski, the Director of Global Health for the Skull Global Threats Fund. Um, and uh, my job here is in 15 minutes to sort of bring you all onto the same page about what we mean uh, about One Health and what we mean about disease surveillance. Uh, so for all of the developers in the audience who may not be epidemiologists, you can be an honorary epidemiologist after these 15 minutes. So, <clears throat> it's not really a mystery of why we see diseases spreading rapidly around the world. There are many, many factors that cause diseases to spread, but two of the most important ones are obviously we can get on an airplane now and fly anywhere around the world faster than the incubation period for many diseases. So people can get on an airplane completely asymptomatic, uh, no signs of an infection, and then arrive somewhere on the other side of the planet and become ill with the disease. So this is one of the largest regions why we're seeing diseases spread so quickly. Could we move this up a little? Uh, seems like we're cutting off the slides. Um, Natalie? Is it possible to move the projector? Um, but the, the other reason, obviously, is the fact that almost uh, all of the new diseases that have emerged around the world in the last several decades, SARS, uh, you know, H5N1, the various diseases, are zoonotic diseases, meaning they're spreading from animals to humans. So those two factors alone, are one of the reasons our sister organization, Participant Media, also owned by Jeff Skoll, uh, made this film Contagion. And the real purpose of this was to bring that one health message out that we're not in this alone as humans, that we have to think about how diseases emerge because of our interaction with animals and other factors in the environment are really what brings one health to bear on dealing with infectious diseases. So, this is where you'll learn quickly how to become an epidemiologist. And I hope we can move these up because we're gonna need them when we get to the bottom. But this is an epi curve. So for those of you who are not epidemiologists, this is our secret weapon of trying to track diseases. We literally monitor the number of infections over time. So the time is on the bottom axis and these are the number of cases and then this is the epi curve for all the people that would be infected by a given outbreak. So generally we find out about most disease outbreaks because in every country we have reportable diseases. So if we have a case of infectious disease that gets reported to the health authorities, an investigation goes and the resulting is the epi curve and the amount of people who get sick from disease. Now we've done a lot to improve our ability to reduce the number of people who get infected by any outbreak. And one of the things that has caused us to be faster is that clinicians are much more aware of the importance of reporting an unusual case of infection. And that has helped us find outbreaks faster. Other things that have helped is we've set up networks around the world. The one that people may have heard about, if you're not an infectious disease person, is the one for influenza. So we have a tracking system for flu that involves laboratories around the world that monitor what is circulating so that we can find the newest strain of influenza faster and develop a vaccine. And we have other sentinel networks for foodborne diseases, for sexually transmitted diseases, and other things that have helped us find outbreaks faster and reduce the burden. What we're here today to talk about is really the new efforts that have emerged in the last couple of decades that have been termed digital disease detection, uh, which is really encompassing a lot of different elements. The one that sort of generated this term initially is that we can look at large data sets now uh, of any information that's online that could be a report of an infectious disease 
And that has led us to find outbreaks, even in parts of the world that don't have good public health systems, a newspaper story or some other event that gets recorded and online can now be searched automatically, and we found many outbreaks around the world using this process. And in fact, the World Health Organization responds to about 50% of the outbreaks around the world because they're first picked up by an automated system. And we'll talk about a few of those in detail. Some of the things mentioned here, which we think is even pushing it further, is to engage the public directly. So we believe that participatory epidemiology is a way that we can put the public directly into public health, and we hope help us to find outbreaks faster. Now, I'm sorry you can't see this bottom thing because this is really important for the One Health component, but to reduce our outbreaks in human disease, we need to be finding these outbreaks faster in animals. So that's really the One Health movement, is can we not only be better about finding outbreaks faster in humans, but if we did better surveillance in animals and integrated the human-animal environment, then we might actually be able to stop human disease altogether. So that's our long-term vision. This is just to show you that we've made a lot of progress as a global community. So at the bottom here, in 1996, on an average around the world for outbreaks that literally were pathogens, viruses or bacteria that literally could spread around the world, it took us about 167 days to find those outbreaks and by 2009 we were down to 23 days. So our idea as the School Global Threats Fund is to really invest in ways to find outbreaks everywhere around the world faster so that we literally respond to them while they're local threats, or at most a regional threat, and really eliminate the fear that things should spread around the world as a pandemic threat. We think that that's not inevitable anymore, that we literally can eliminate the idea of things having to become a pandemic. So if you're wondering what the difference between 167 days and 23 days would look like in a real world situation, if you took a disease like measles, if you found an outbreak of measles in 167 days, this is probably what the epi curve would look like. If we could find that first case in 23 days, that's what the resulting epi curve would look like. So you can see there's a huge advantage of finding outbreaks faster in reducing the suffering and deaths of everybody as a population as a whole. So I had the privilege of working with some engineers at Google in 2006 when we were trying to figure out, are there new tools that we can bring to disease surveillance? And one of the ideas was, could we look at what everybody was searching on Google and figure out whether we could track influenza faster because we could see when the search terms looked like they were related to influenza. And we were able to do this because Google has such large computing capacity that we didn't have to predetermine what we thought people were searching related to flu. We could actually look at every single search made on Google and match them to the curve of influenza because in the United States we have a flu season and then we have no flu season and so we have a very definite pattern and we could match that pattern exactly how people searched on Google. So what you see here is, in the blue, is the prediction that we were able to make at Google, where we would call the Center for Disease Control and we would say, we're seeing a level of influenza at a certain level, you can't see on the left, let's say it's 3%, and CDC would say, no, we're still only seeing 1% activity. But then two weeks later, the yellow curve would match exactly the search curve. So what was happening is people were going to the computer, searching for symptoms of disease, maybe where to go to the doctor and so forth, and that allowed us to actually track the level of flu in the United States two weeks faster than our official system at the CDC. Now with that being said, we're not suggesting that these kinds of innovations can replace public health surveillance, because what the Center for Disease Control does is they collect samples from people who come to the doctor, which we absolutely need, because A, Google Flu Trends doesn't tell us for sure that it's flu. It's just an approximation of the amount of disease and the time, 
but we absolutely need to have those samples to test for the virus and to confirm that it's flu. But that being said, a two-week advance notice on influenza can be very important when we have a shortage of vaccines and we need to decide where to send them in the United States, and by getting early indicators, that can be a helpful process. This is published in Nature if anybody wants to read the details of the study. So now that we've moved past 2009, this is where we are today. And we think there are new technologies and policies and innovations that can even drive that 23 days down faster. Uh, we were recently in the Dominican Republic where they've set up their own digital disease detection system and they're able to find and respond to any outbreak within 48 hours. Now, if we could do that everywhere around the world, we would absolutely eliminate the threat of pandemics. Uh, but we have a long ways to go uh, in many places. So, these are just some of the examples of new organizations that have popped up just in the last 10 years that are looking at new technologies as ways to find outbreaks faster. And so at Skoll, uh, we were looking at the success of some of these efforts and thinking, could we do something to find an outbreak even faster? So we developed a tool with our partners uh, in Harvard, uh, at Boston Children's Hospital at HealthMap, for a tool called Flu Near You. So in the United States, you can sign up as a volunteer, and it's a mobile or web-based platform. And when you sign up, it's very simple. It's anonymous, it's just by your, uh, your zip code, so we can monitor where you are. And we just ask you, do you have any of these 10 symptoms of disease? And I know you can't see those in the back, but it's like fever, cough, shortness of breath, or you check the box that says you don't have any symptoms. And then you see yourself on a map immediately as a red pin if your symptoms are compatible with influenza, which we calculate on the back end, or you show yourself as a green or blue pin if you have no disease. And people can follow when flu becomes uh, prevalent in their area and monitor the spread, as well as we're trying to figure out some of the issues about how effective are vaccines. Because I get a flu shot every year, nobody ever comes back and asks me if I got the flu. But through crowdsourcing, where we provide information on where you can get a vaccine and make it easy for you, we also ask people whether they got vaccinated to try to figure out what the real efficacy is. So this was after our second year playing out in real time every week uh, self-reported data alone, and we were able to track uh, influenza uh, within the United States, and that continues today, with about 80,000 volunteers in the system helping us monitor this threat. So while that's really exciting for us in the U.S. to be playing in this space of digital disease detection about flu, this is what we really care about. So when I was talking about these new diseases that are jumping from animals to humans, this is what uh, the resulting variables look like. EcoHealth Alliance is a group in the US who created this map. And I know it's hard to see, but the yellow to red areas may increase risk. So these are factors like vector-borne diseases, population, travel, all of that is factored in to figure out where are the hotspots for disease surveillance or for disease outbreaks. So here I blew up this area and you can see that Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, which isn't a surprise to those of you who live here, have a lot of diseases that are emerging from animals and it's why we decided to focus on this particular area. And as Kang was saying, we started the idea of supporting local developers within the countries of Asia and Southeast Asia to actually work with the animal and human and environmental health groups to figure out ways to bring this technology to solve the problems locally. And we think the best way to do that is to invest in local people directly in solving these problems. So this was the first epi hack that we had in Phnom Penh, and now here we are finally having the one in Chiang Mai. So this is my final slide, and I just wanted to make a comment here that we are very excited to finally be working in an area where in One Health, um, I met Dr. Lundlach several years ago and began a conversation about One Health, and I have in these last five years not found any organization 
uh, like Chiang Mai University, that really understands One Health and what it means to integrate human, animal, and environmental issues. Uh, as a personal story in the United States, now 15 years ago, when West Nile came to the US, we completely missed that because the animal health people knew the birds were dying off in the zoo from West Nile, but we never connected that to the human cases that were being surveyed. So 15 years later, here we are with really no example in the world about seriously trying to do surveillance that integrates those human animal environmental issues as a single platform. And we think that our partners here at Chiang Mai University really are the leaders in One Health. And we're excited this week to be working with all of you to help them try to take this vision further, along with some of their local partners, the group at Syracuse Hospital, who we met for the first time last August, have really taken the idea of community-based surveillance farther than anywhere I've seen. And I think merging these ideas where the community health involvement with the One Health expertise, along with the great developer community here with Open Dream, and as you can see, the support of the Thai Health Promotion Foundation has been really important. So these are the partners we brought together to start this process, along with all of you to really help us think through how do we take the idea of One Health participatory surveillance and literally demonstrate to the world that this is possible to do. And I really believe we're gonna be looking a couple years from now at Chiang Mai as the example of how to do surveillance moving forward to the public. And we're really excited that you're all here to be part of this adventure together. So with that, I thank you very much and look forward to meeting all of you over the course of the week.